The US and the UK have historically been very close allies, despite occasional hiccups. So how does the UK's new Labour government intend to chart its course with the United States? Hello and welcome to Roundtable. I'm Enda Brady. Newly minted UK Prime Minister Keir Starmer and the US President Joe Biden are both centre-left leaders. But a question mark hangs over Biden's re-election prospects. Could the transatlantic relationship change if former President Donald Trump returns to the White House? The latest chapter in the special relationship. U.S. President Joe Biden became the first world leader to congratulate Keir Starmer after his Labour Party won a landslide election, making him the UK's Prime Minister. Our two countries are going to continue our special relationship. We're working together just about every issue, supporting Ukraine, managing the competition with China, advancing cooperation in the Pacific with AUKUS. The U.S. has arguably been the U.K.'s most important strategic ally since World War II. Starmer and Biden both occupy the centre-left of the country's politics. With a host of unknowns on the horizon, it seems likely that they will approach many of them in lockstep. Some are to do with geopolitics, how to react to Russian President Vladimir Putin, China, the war in Gaza and the rise of the far right in Europe. While the US is important to the UK militarily and politically, it is the EU that remains its largest trading partner. But Starmer inherits a UK that is now outside the Union. Weakened by Brexit, an ailing economy and a revolving door of recent Prime Ministers, Starmer says boosting ties with the EU is a top priority. Some analysts say Starmer is trying to make the UK the US's key ally in Europe again. We do that with a very strong mandate now, um, a very strong uh, mandate for change, uh, for a different relationship with the EU, a different way of doing politics. But one person who could take some of the shine off this special relationship is this guy. Donald Trump and Starmer couldn't be more different in style, substance or ideology. A second Trump presidency could leave the UK isolated, both to its east and west. But Starmer is a pragmatist. His ministers have been preparing for any eventuality, including a second Trump term, and appear to have been courting both sides of the aisle in the US. Foreign Secretary David Lamy, who lived and studied in the US, has reportedly been in touch with several Trump advisers. The United States is our key international partner. We have a special relationship with whomever is in the White House. And of course, whomever the United States choose as their president later on this year, we will work very closely with. Thank you. Thank you. With unpredictability being Trump's main weapon, his return to the White House could make Starmer's life next year, well, complicated. Well, let's meet our guests in Athens. We have Vicky Price. She's an international economist and a former UK government advisor. Here with me in the studio is Greg Swinson. He is chairperson of Republicans Overseas UK and Elizabeth Braw. She is senior fellow at the Atlantic Council Scowcroft Centre for Strategy and Security. You're all very welcome to Roundtable. Greg, I'll come to you first. When we talk about the relationship between the UK and the USA, the Brits use this phrase, the special relationship. Is it still special? I think it is. And it, it occasionally goes through speed bumps. And they're doing a lot of great work on this at the Legatum Institute. And, and it's been, it's been an, a, a relationship, you know, really since the, the, the great Second World War. But, and it, gone through a few speed bumps, but we'll always get over it. And I think it's, yes, you can argue it's more important to the UK because of the, just the scale of, of the economy and the scale of the military. But it is definitely important to the US. Elizabeth, your take on the special relationship, does it still st have that kind of stardust to it or is it fading? Uh, it does, but it's, it, it really is a, a special relationship primarily for the UK. And we have seen in recent years, uh, under Democratic and Republican presidents, that they've uh, tilted America's foreign policy more towards uh, 
Africa, um, especially more towards Asia. And I think we all remember Obama's Pacific tilt. And, and it's, it, the US keeps coming back to the UK, but it's no, no, uh, nobody is under the illusion that it's any sort of a, a equal a partnership of equals. It is the senior partner and the junior partner. We saw it most recently in the Red Sea when there was a question of what to do about the Houthis. The US and the UK initiated a coalition led, of course, by, by the US with the, the UK being essentially the wing man, but there is, there is no shame in being the wingman. That is the role that is appropriate for a mid-sized country. Vicky, that's a great phrase, isn't it? There's no shame in being the wingman. How do you think Keir Starmer will be a wingman for whoever ends up running America for the next few years post-November? Well, it's really interesting uh, what has just been described as, as being really the junior partner in this special relationship. And, and of course, the U.S. has other interests, but uh, there is no doubt that the U.K. has been there to support uh, the U.S. in various initiatives. I mean, just think back about the Iraq war, for example, and, and loads of other uh, such adventures, if you want to call them that. Um, there is also a different relationship in terms of trade. Um, that exists between the UK and the US than it does with other countries because the US remains uh, the number one trading partner as a single country. Of course, the EU is still, of course, overall uh, the main trading area for the UK, despite uh, the, the fact that we have left uh, the European Union itself. Um, but also in terms of investment, I mean, the interesting thing is that uh, number one investors in the UK are the US. Um, and uh, the other countries follow after that. India in particular has taken over from other countries in Europe as being one of the major uh, investors in the UK, but certainly the US remains very, very important, very significant. So uh, what will happen in November and after, because of course uh, the new president takes um, actually power sometime in uh, just the beginning of the new year after that is going to be very, very significant about whether there is any change that happens because of that. And I don't think uh, there, there is very clear um, idea right now as to exactly how this new relationship might move. We're talking about putting political appointments as uh, ambassadors to the US, the one who was supposed to go, uh, who had been um, fingered, if you like, to do that job for the UK under the Conservative government is apparently no longer going to be the person who would do it. So it remains to be seen who it is. And I think the decision on who to appoint may well depend on who they think might deal better with them um, if there is a change with President Trump. Well, Vicky, you mentioned the trading relationship. Despite that special relationship with the US, it's the European Union that continues to be the UK's biggest trading partner. In 2023, the UK exported $461 billion worth of goods and services to the EU. But if you look at individual countries, it's the US that takes top spot. Last year, the UK exported $247 billion worth of goods and services to the United States. So that's a hell of a lot of money, Greg, isn't it? It really is. And consider that it's without a, a bilateral trade deal you know, which, which has been talked about now for years. And I thought it would happen under the, the prior Trump administration because you had conservative governments on both sides of the Atlantic. And President Trump is a real Anglophile. I mean, he, he was really uh, a big fan of the UK. And the Queen. And, and of course. And, you know, he had two visits here. One was a state visit. He was very pro-UK. And I think that there was a, I mentioned speed bumps. I thought the Biden administration in many ways was a speed bump. No chance of a trade deal at all in the Biden administration. At least there was a chance with Trump and I hope there is again. But, but I think that if you look at some of the, the slights, you know, the Afghanistan not taking Boris's phone call and sort of overlooking Rishi Sunak at times um, on, on uh, trade, trade visits. So, you know, I think that was probably a speed bump, and I would look forward to a President Trump that'll, that'll be much more aggressive with, uh, with the UK and the relationship. So if President Trump happens again, Elizabeth, and he's president for the second time, these are very different men. Keir Starmer and Donald Trump, I mean, it doesn't get much different, does it? Uh, the only thing that would be more different would be Donald Trump and Jeremy Corbyn, but that didn't come to pass. And now we may have uh, Trump and Keir Starmer extremely different in political outlook and especially in personality. And uh, personal traits matter so much at the highest levels of diplomacy. Whether leaders get along at a personal level is decisive. And, and uh, I don't need to re repeat World War II history and, and the... the, uh, the 
disharmony there was among certain allied leaders. Uh, but I think what what uh, Labour has done well, and, and in particular what some of the what what some of the new uh, cabinet uh, ministers have done well, is planning ahead for this day that may come. So David Lammy, who is now Foreign Secretary, uh, John Healy, who is now Defence Secretary, have been for the past four years or so, while they've been serving in the shadow cab, while they were serving in the shadow cabinet, uh, made regular trips to Washington to see not just Democrats but especially Republicans, because they knew that not only could the U.S get a new Trump administration, but it could also get a Republican majority in Congress. And that relationship has to work even if you disagree politically, even if you have different personalities. So Labour have been laying the groundwork, regardless. It has, it has, and that will be paying off. Vicky, what do you think of the dynamics of this relationship possibly to come? Starmer firmly embedded now in number 10 with a huge majority and Donald Trump possibly being sworn in in January next year. On the political front, of course, we've seen that the UK has been way ahead of loads of others in terms of the support for Ukraine. So I think it's one of the things that they've been discussing, and now they're saying they're all in uh, in line with each other. But of course, we'll see what happens with if there is a, a change of presidents with President Trump, uh, if he were to be re-elected. So that's one of the question marks that's important. In terms of what's happening on the economic front, I mean, the truth is that the US has become quite protectionist itself. Uh, Europe outside the UK is also becoming a bit more protectionist. We've got in the US the IRA, which is the Inflation Reduction Act, a lot of subsidies going for particularly green investment, but basically encouraging firms to go and establish themselves there. A lot of firms from the UK are now being attracted to do IPOs in the in the US. So there is a drift away, if you like, from the UK to the US in, in, in this area, and serious concern about where the UK will be left if we have, on the one side, Europe becoming a lot more protectionist itself, with Draghi, the former uh, Prime Minister of Italy, of course, and before that, head of the Central Bank, the European Central Bank, producing this big uh, competitiveness report for Europe, which is going to be saying how they can become uh, you know, stronger in particular areas, you know, where will they leave the UK, and the US, of course, moving ahead with its own regime, where you know perhaps the UK has a little bit of chance of taking part in it, but in general is putting the UK in a sort of you know in, in a bit of isolation because it's not part of the EU and it's not part of of uh, whatever is being planned in in the US. So it is a bit of a difficult position, and it might get more difficult uh, after November. So I think this is one of the areas that. Uh, Starmer will be very interested in because, of course, what the government uh, has said it wants to do, and it did that uh, very firmly in terms of its manifesto, uh, is to uh, focus on growth. And, and it does need more trade. Uh, it does need more investment. And uh, if you don't get that from the US, or if there is any reduction in that, as we discussed earlier, in terms of the uh, importance of the US also in investment, not just trade for Europe, for the UK, um, then that would be a serious uh, you know, setback in terms of its agenda for growth. Greg, talk to me about Keir Starmer. What do Americans think of him? I know it's very, very early days and many Americans possibly won't even know anything about his backstory or the fact that he's in Downing Street, but just give us your impressions of Keir Starmer. I think so far, you know, it, it doesn't look, at least from the way he's presented himself during the campaign in the last few years as, as shadow secretary, that, you know, he is, or shadow leader, sorry, but he is not considered a radical. I think there was a lot of equating between Jeremy, you know, uh, uh, Bernie Sanders and Jeremy Corbyn back in the day. And, and the view is that Keir Starmer is not quite as radical. Now, we'll see. But I think the one advantage is that now you, at least for a few more months, you have parties of the left running both countries. And so that might actually be good for the relationship because I think there was some tension when you have, you know, like President Biden, a Democrat, trying to work with the conservative government with the Tories. So, so I think that there might be a, a window, but it will be a short window because it looks like Trump, you know, is, is looking likely to, to win re-election. Elizabeth, historically, we've seen incredible relationships. You think back Reagan and Thatcher, think back Blair and George W. Bush Jr. Um, and Blair and Clinton. And Blair and Clinton. These were relationships that were turned into friendships almost. 
Can you see that possibility with Starmer and, say, Trump? I mean, it looks highly unlikely, doesn't it? <laughs> I think we're entering the realm of wishful thinking. <laughs> but the, the, the truth is that, that when political leaders at the highest international levels, uh, they, they are in, in, a, in a very exclusive club and they deal with uh, one another on, on a regular basis. And it, it is... Uh, uh, you are in, in an exposed position as head of government. There aren't many people you can deal with on a, on a, on a basis of, of um, equal burden and equal concerns. And so that puts prime ministers and presidents in, in a sort of a position of trust vis-a-vis -vis one another. But I, I don't think that, that uh, the combination Starmer-Trump can ever, uh, could ever produce that, that sort of uh, basis of, of yeah. Um, uh, yeah. friendship and, and maybe political convergence that could, could uh, give the, the world really uh, significant initiatives of the kind that we have seen in the past. Uh, but uh, it, there, there, it, it's not just Trump. Osama could achieve something like that with, with various European leaders and not just leaders of the left. If we look at Giorgia Meloni, she is uh, of Italy. She is a pragmatist just like uh, Keir Starmer. And who knows what the two of them could think of, for example. Vicky, we live in quite strange times. There's conflict everywhere. There's so many issues. I mean, seeing Britain having a statesman as a leader again, who everyone will wish Starmer well that he can go out there and start rebuilding Britain's international reputation, this is a very important, important relationship, isn't it? That Starmer hits the ground running and whoever's in the White House, he's able to get their attention and have them on site. Well, yes. I mean, the interesting thing about the election results in the UK is that uh, because of this big majority, we have... Uh, uh, the prospects of a lot more stability ahead and things perhaps, you know, going through Parliament more easily than would otherwise be the case. And for investors, it's good news. What you've seen is a bit of a pickup that's taking place right now in terms of confidence. And also consumers are a bit more confident. So it looks like a country which which may be, you know, forging ahead somehow or other. And, and people are revising their, their forecasts also up for the UK economy instead of 0.5% that we thought maybe 1.1% or 1.2% in 2024 might still be possible. We got the latest data on, on for May on GDP, which were also quite positive. Uh, so, so all that is good and therefore, you know, Starmer looks strong. And if anyone wanted to do any deals, if you like, or work more closely with a country which looks reasonably stable, the UK sort of stands out because there isn't a huge amount of stability in some other countries, like uh, France, if one wants to mention one. But yes, there, there are also other possibilities uh, in terms of working together with, you know, for the UK with other countries in Europe, and they're trying to have a rapprochement. Um, they do want to have better trade relationships. Stammer has already been talking about that, and, uh, and so have members of his cabinet. And I think if you want to have a bit more sustained growth, given that we're unlikely to have a UK... Uh, EU, sorry, a UK-US uh, trade agreement, a, an improvement in the UK-EU uh, trade relations might actually make uh, make a lot of sense. So the question therefore is, again, when you're looking at relationship with the US versus relationship with Europe, with Europe, then perhaps yes, um, you can improve those with Europe quite likely more easily than you can with the US, given what is going on right now on the trade front. Um, but on the defence front. Uh, also, there are moves in Europe to be closer together, uh, but certainly the US is going to remain a very important partner, uh, irrespective of whether we are in the UK the, the weaker, the, the junior partner or not. Greg, talk to me about NATO, and I'll bring you in on this as well, Elizabeth. Um, it's a very, very interesting time, isn't it? And yeah. President Biden said the other day when he met Starmer that you guys, meaning the UK, are the knot that ties us together. That was the phrase President Biden used. Yeah, I think he's got a really great point, and I would agree with President Biden on that. If you look at the other great powers in Europe, or in NATO specifically, Germany, France, Spain, Italy even, they're not spending, you know, they're not hitting their 2% targets. All, you know, this is good news that we've gone from four countries to up now to 23 countries in the alliance meeting their target, but they're all the smaller economies. So it's not really moving the needle. So, so he, we need to get France... Germany, Spain on board. The UK obviously has been a great partner in NATO forever. The biggest concern that both the UK and as well as the rest of NATO should have is that President Biden has cut defense spending in the US in real terms, 3% three years in a row. First time in 30 years that it's below 3% of GDP. And 
the U.S. is still half of NATO defense spending. So that's a 4.5% cut in NATO defense spending. That's completely overlooked in a lot of the reporting when they're talking about Trump versus Biden. Trump was building up the military or rebuilding it, sp increasing defense spending. The biggest concern that they should have in Europe is three years in a row of 3% in real-term defense cuts. Elizabeth, just on the NATO side of things, it's important, isn't it, that Starmer is a leader in the room and that the UK can start kind of building up its international reputation again? Uh, yes, and, and this is a testimony to the way the UK does transitions. Uh, in any other country, if you had an election on the 4th of July, you would not be having a prime minister travelling to the summit uh, just a few days, to uh, the NATO 75th anniversary summit just a few days later. But that's how we do transition in the UK. And that uh, then meant that... Uh, the UK and Keir Starmer personally were able to be there and present, uh, demonstrate that the UK remains as committed as ever to, to strong defence and to NATO. Uh, and if I can just follow up on the point, uh, point that Vicky made about investment and the important, uh, of importance of investments and the fact that uh, UK companies are, and, and indeed European companies, are investing in the US now thanks to the IRA. This is an area where both Democrats and Republicans forget how important America's best friends are. The IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act, has been great for America. It's uh, attracting all kinds of European companies uh, uh, there and they, because they get subsidies for, for setting up factories, especially in, uh, in, in the green economy, and this reduces America's dependence on China. But these are also many UK and European companies that... Uh, I think from a European perspective, should be coming back to us, not go to America. And it baffles me that American legislators didn't understand or didn't care that this would be the effect the IRA would have on America's closest friends, because that friendship matters not just in defence, but in trade as well. Vicky, just bring you in on that. I mean, America obviously does what's best for America. Of course, but I agree entirely with what Elizabeth just said. Uh, that this is a problem and the unintended consequences, if you like, which we economists always like to talk about, uh, perhaps had not been thought out. Um, uh, but of course, I mean, the interesting thing for me is how all the, the green lobby and the climate uh, change uh, people who are you know, absolutely right in what they're worrying about, but they all said, great, the IRA, because what it does is it encourages a lot more investment in this area. Well, yes, fine, but what does it mean for the rest of, for the rest of us? And is investment being drained away and going into the US and leaving other countries perhaps slightly more exposed? And of course, needing to find some extra money to uh, do the same thing back, back home, wherever they are. And it's interesting also when we talk about defense, what Stammer has done, is saying, yes, yes, he's going to be moving also to the 3% target, um, but he's going to be you know, looking at that a little bit more carefully um, because, of course, it's uh, you know, just even 2.5% is very, very costly um, because, uh, of course, we are in the middle of a fiscal crisis uh, and a lot needs to be spent to just get our defence capability uh, to a level where we can be certain we can actually operate normally. So there is a huge amount of spending that will need to be done. How exactly you're going to get to the point of uh, having met the, the requirements, if you like, that the US would like us to, to have as well, since um, looking forward, uh, it's going to be something which I think the, the Treasury uh, Secretary, which is, of course, Rachel Reeves, who is the Chancellor, uh, is going to be looking at very carefully before we commit the resources bearing in mind that defence spending as a percentage of GDP had been going down in the UK during the austerity years of the previous government. So it is a big, big issue uh, in terms of you know, finding the money, having the right investment uh, that allows for some of those obligations to be met, including, of course, you know, spending enough on the green agenda, which we absolutely all need to do. Craig, whether some people like it or not, Keir Starmer is going to be British Prime Minister for at least the next five years. Stability is back. We've seen changes and changes. One prime minister, bless her, she lasted six weeks. Yeah. How important is it from the American point of view that you've got someone in Downing Street who you know is going to be there long term? I think it's important. I mean, I might not be a supporter of, of, of the, the party, but stability is important. You know, with the, all the turnover at 10 Downing Street, was it, it didn't make the UK look very good. You know, so I think in spite of being from a different political perspective than, than Prime Minister Starmer. I think five years in the chair would be a really welcome change from what we've seen in the past. So, look, I, I mean, again, if Trump will probably not have the relationship 
that, you know, with, with Keir Starmer that he had with Boris or with some of the other Tory PMs. But I think uh, consistency would be good right now. Elizabeth, we've heard people say that Nigel Farage will be the, if Trump comes back in, Farage will be the conduit for Anglo-American relations. That's just not going to happen, is it? Well, he may well be the conduit, but the, the question is who will receive his messages back in the UK and whether he will be trusted here. Uh, he has been very clever in building that relationship with Trump over the years, including when Trump was out in the wilderness for a short while before Republicans decided that they would uh, team up with him again and sort of <laughs> bring him back into the fold or, or join his fold, rather. Um, but... Uh, Nigel Farage was, uh, has been consistent in his support uh, for, uh, for Donald Trump, and I think that will pay off. The question is whether, the, 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 whether he will have an interlocutor here in the UK, outside the Reform Party, who is willing to listen to any messages that he, he may uh, be delivering from Donald Trump. Elizabeth, Greg and Vicky in Athens, thank you all so much. Remember, you can see more discussion and debate on our YouTube channel. Just search for Roundtable. TRT World, but for now, from me and the Brady and all of the team here, goodbye and thank you for watching.